Since the 1950s, the Wake campus has been home to the Australian Wine Research Institute, which today boasts over 150 research and extension staff. Our next speaker, Richard Gall, is a sensory scientist at the AWRI. Richard has over 30 years of research and teaching experience and is also one of Australia's top judges of olive oils. Richard will be talking to us about research he's involved in that seeks to explain why particular wines are perceived differently when we take a mouthful. Richard Gore. Uh, it was around 1998 when I um, strolled up the road uh, to Portmouth Road to a bottle shop. I think there's a few locals here today. Remember Bailey's and Bailey's? Um, and I went up to the attendant and I said, I'll have one of those, one of those. And while he went to find the key to open up the display cabinet, I found the $750 or roughly $2,500 of today's money um, to buy at least two bottles of wine. Um, uh, they happen to be two of uh, two wines from the Burgundy region of Central France. This is a Pinot Noir from the Latache Vineyard. This, is, this was a Chardonnay of, um, from a vineyard called um, Mont Mont Um Well, actually, that's what's left of them anyway. <laughs> um, so, but what possessed me to part with that was actually two weeks of salary. And as it turned out, it's a true story, quite an extended stint in the marital doghouse um, <laughs> because of two bottles of wine. Well, I was buying in a, an experience. The experience I was looking for um, was something that all the great wines in the world have, and they're usually very eye-wateringly expensive as well. And that was a thing called mouthfeel. Now, uh, mouthfeel is something that defines all the great wines of the world. Yes, they all Yes, they, have flavor, they need flavour as well. There's something about, and people pay a lot of money for this, just to get this really lovely feel in your mouth when you taste the wine. First of all, what is mouthfeel? And, and also, what are the things in wine that actually uh, influence how it feels? Now, these are the questions that we've been grappling with at the Wine Research Institute and also at the University of Adelaide uh, for some time. Um, some, some time ago, we got a, a whole bunch of some of Australia's most experienced winemakers together and also some of the very, very experienced tasters and critics. And we, take, we tasted about 250 wines, another difficult gig at the AWRI. Um, <laughs> and, um, but we teased out of them what they thought mouthfeel was. Now, there's a lot going on in here. Um, but look, in a nutshell, it, it can be distilled into three major components. Um, the first component, is what's called viscosity or fullness or richness or weight. Um, the second one is it relates to sort of a physical feeling you have in your mouth, which we call warmth or hotness. And third is a characteristic that's very important in red wines, and it's called astringency. Now, probably just to uh, get your head around what I mean by weight, hotness, and also astringency. So what you close your eyes for a second. Okay. Now I want you to think about, and hopefully you're coffee drinkers, I want you to think about a, a rich, <coughs> luscious, thick espresso coffee. You know the ones with the, the crema on the top? All right. Now think about that for a sec. Now think about filter coffee that you get in an aeroplane. <laughs> Now, obviously, one is, has, is really rich and thick um, and very mouth-filling, and the other one is thin and watery. And that's a good analogy for um, the viscosity and, and fullness in wine. Um, I'll talk about hotness a little bit later, but, so we'll move on to astringency. Now, probably the... You can open your eyes now. Not that open. <laughs> um, astringency is... Uh, a very good analogy is cold black tea or cranberry juice. Um, the aftertaste of both of those, you'll, um, you'll often find that your mouth will feel very dry or rough, or if, you, if the tea is strong enough, or, or the wine is strong enough, what you'll find is that your mouth will, will constrict and pucker, so like this. 
All right? It sort of reminds you of, when looking at it, it's like a cat's bottom. <laughs> now, the only reason I use that analogy, it's a bit gross, I know, but the only reason I use it is because we've all seen one. So, and I thought, <laughs> that So, what's actually uh, in wine that could cause differences in mouthfeel? Well, if you deconstruct a wine um, into its component parts, obviously there's thousands of different things in there, but um, these are the major, like the major bits and pieces that make up a wine. Now, clearly, I've coloured these because um, they normally don't come in crow's colours. <laughs> I only noticed that this morning when I was actually putting them together and I went, oh, um, anyway, it's most of it, most of wine is water. So around about 85 to 90 percent is water. Then this is the stuff here. This makes up most of the rest. It's what yeast produce when they get grape sugars and they convert them into alcohol. Alcohol, well done. About 10 to 15 percent. Then, in a long distance third, is this. Uh, substance here is called glycerol. I don't know if you can see it, I've coloured it quite dark red. And you see how it's, it actually takes quite a long time to fall off the side of the, of this bottle. And that's because it's, it's very, very viscous as far as things in wine anyway. It's about 600 times as viscous as water. Then we've got the acids from grape. There's about a teaspoon of, um, of acids that end up in wine. Um, they give the wine its characteristic tartness. And then, believe it or not, in wines that aren't sweet, you get about a tiny little amount of sugar like that. It's about a gram that's left over that the yeast somehow missed when it was fermenting. There's other things, um, and these are the mystery things that uh, um, explain a lot about mouthful. So we'll, we'll talk about those later. These five things here are called the lime matrix. Side, now the reason they're called the part of the wine matrix is because you find them in all wines. Every wine has them, red wines, white wines, and they're roughly in the same proportion regardless of wine. Look, there's no doubt that what's these five things, they interact um, to, to give an overall impression of mouthful. But no matter how much I could try, I could sit here and I could mix and match all of these forever, I would not be able to create something that has a mouthful of real wine, let alone a mouthful of great wines like this. So there must be something else in wine that is causing um, it to have its characteristic lovely mouthful. These other things in wine are the mystery things. Give the, the wine its mouthful personality, if you like. These things give it its, its skeleton and its flesh, but the other things give it personality. And we'll probably start with this one here. Now, this is alcohol, obviously. Now, if wines with higher amounts of alcohol taste hotter, they just do. They have, they're more warming, and after a while, they get quite hot. That's probably not a surprise if you're one of those people that enjoys their mouthwash in the morning. Um, but uh, it's it's something that it's important to winemakers because. One way to get really good flavour in your wine is to let the grapes ripen. Riper grapes have more flavour than green grapes. But that comes with higher sugar, which then ends up with more alcohol, which means you, you can end up with wines that taste quite hot and spirituous, more like vodka than wine. So, but what we did notice, is something we've known for a long time, if you get, so this wine here was 13.5% alcohol. If I mixed these two together to make the 13% alcohol exactly the same as that one, I would guarantee you that this wine here would not taste as hot as that. In fact, it's the same of any wine. No matter what alcohol level, wines always don't, at a certain alcohol level, alcohol level do not taste as hot as a mixture of water and alcohol. So again, there's something in those wines that there's in real wines that are suppressing or acting like a fire blanket for alcohol hotness. Well, after a lot of searching in the Wine Research Institute, we've tracked down this little fella here. Um, it's one of the polysaccharide family as well, again. Um, and it's, 
it actually, we know that when there's this in the in the wine, the wine seems to not, taste not quite as hot. Um, we don't know exactly why, how it works, but somehow it must block alcohol's ability to interact with the receptors in your mouth surfaces that are responsible for irritation and heat. What we do know is they come from grapes. And what we're actively doing now is working out how to get more of this out of the grape and into wine um, so we can actually produce wines with, with better amount of Getting back to this one here, you would think if a wine had a lot of this in it, it would be really viscous. Well, we, what we found is it's not. It has very little effect on viscosity in wine. Ethan, alcohol is also a little bit viscous. It also doesn't have a big effect. And polysaccharides, which are often used as food thickeners in the food, in the food industry, also don't have an effect. However, when you put, combine them all with so higher alcohol, higher glycerol, and higher polysaccharides, you end up with fuller wines. So here's a great example of how mouthfeel works. Often the individual components don't do much, but together they, they work together to produce something. The other thing we found that was really unsurprising was that wines that were lower in acid had less of this stuff in it. That fullness became turbocharged. It became even greater still. So we're starting to work out what, it, what needs to be in wine and not in wine that will end up with uh, greater amounts of fullness. And finally, astringency. Astringency is caused by um, tannins that come from the grapes and seeds during ferment, when wine's fermented. And here's some tannins that I've pulled out of a, out of a red wine, and that's about how much you get uh, in a red wine. Now, tannins are, are, are known for doing certain things. And one of them is, in your, in your mouth you have, you have a lot of saliva, and your saliva contains proteins which make it very slippery. Slippery and, and, and lubricating. When they, they come in contact with a tannin, they, um, the tannin then interacts with that saliva and they lose their lubrication. Just getting the two mystery ones together. The other thing too, what we found is that this polysaccharide here um, is about 500 to 1,000 sugars long, um, and so it's a very big molecule. And we, we believe this molecule here wraps around the smaller tannin, which stops it from interacting with the saliva. So you end up with softer wines as a result. Tannins are also really complicated. They um, there's 70 different types in white wine. There's far more in reds, because tannins join with each other, and then nature shoves on sugars and acids, and red, even red wine colour onto them as well. So you end up with hundreds of different types. So every single wine has a different tannin fingerprint. And we believe that that's that, that tannin fingerprint is the thing that makes this wine here, gives it this really soft, silky character, and other wines give you the feeling of a cat's, you know, what's he? <laughs> um, so, look, the days are long gone where I can afford a wine like this. The last time it sold, which was only fairly recently, so I actually sold for seven thousand four hundred and seventy dollars <coughs> um, And I haven't told my wife yet, because um, she would say, why didn't we keep it? Um, but, uh, but anyway, um, the whole purpose of our research is to be able to build in really, really great mouthfeel into wines that you and I can afford every day. And that's our goal at the AWRI. Thank you very much.